Friday night. Uh, we are going to do a Mediter kind of a Mediterranean Middle East um, cooking for tonight. So we're going to be doing shakshuka, um, zata bread, and baklava. So we'll walk through the baklava first because that's going to take some time to cook. So what I need you to do, if you haven't done already, is we're going to melt the butter. So put it in a container, microwave safe, put it in your microwave, or however you want to melt your butter. If you're going to do it in the microwave, suggestion, put a, put a paper towel over it because it will explode <laughs> if you are not careful. So go ahead and warm up your butter. In the meantime, let's go through our um, kind of our process of what we have. So you should all have um, phyllo dough and that we're going to use, we're going to actually cut this in half. So some of the tips to use phyllo dough is use it close or leave it closed while you're not using it. And then when you're ready to use it, then you um, open it up. You thawed in the refrigerator overnight. So hopefully you unthawed it. And then hopefully you left it out room temperature for a little while before you, um, before we're going to work on it. So that's the, the three big things. And then the other, other thing is hands usually are better if they're dry um, so that it doesn't stick all over. So have your um, phyllo dough and your pan. And we're going to get the, um, the filling set. So you all went home with a pre-made filling. I'm going to show for anybody that's not doing, it doesn't, didn't go home with a, a baggie that you will have the opportunity to do it in a food processor, or you could technically mince this up if you have enough, um, if you don't have a food processor, but I'll show you how to use a food processor. Um, so I've got it set up already. And one of the key things is it's always based on safety. So as long as everything is lined up, it will run. So you can pour in your, if you're doing this from um, home without a, a bag of pre-prepared ingredients, we're gonna put this in and actually I had a full two cups in there. And then I'm gonna add my sugar, which is one half cup. Okay. And I can move that off a little bit and then I will put on the lid. So, oh, cinnamon. <laughs> Let's get one thing of cinnamon and then we'll get that rolling. Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> Next, the other thing too is you went home with three, um, three sheets of foil. So for this particular recipe, you're gonna need two of them. So you'll have the two sections of um, foil that are gonna go in for this recipe. All right, so we're going to use a teaspoon. Actually, I'll put this back. We're going to use a teaspoon of cinnamon. So we get that and scrape it to the top. We'll add here. All right. So now that is ready in the food processor to, and again, you'll hear that click, and that's a ticket to know it's going to work. I'm going to pulse it. So we get, a, I would say a, you kind of want a crumb mixture. So if you want to see what we're looking for, we're looking for about that texture. It's just enough that you're not going to be biting into large chunks. So if you want to check um, your consistency, you can do that. The nice thing is this won't turn on with our lid off and everything. So it's still a safe system. All right. So I'm gonna set this aside because I just wanted to give you a heads up on how you use your food processor. So we'll set that aside for now. And we're gonna use what you, what you took home. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're actually going to um, unroll our phyllo dough. So get your phyllo dough out. And this is basically like um, paper. <clears throat> it's basically like a paper dough. So you can get it and unroll it. Okay. And if it's if you have a few edges that tear, that's okay. Um, I'm gonna unroll it. And this one actually looks like it completely tore through a couple layers, which is fine. Don't don't worry, you still can use it. We're going to try and cut it on that half point. So we're going to actually um, take 
two of those layers of foil and we're gonna cut it in half. So we're gonna use our foil to cut it, to cut the phyllo dough on it. But before we do that, I can actually put um, half, we're gonna cut through half. Okay, and we're gonna transfer half onto my two sheets of foil. So take one of those halves, You're gonna lay it across, okay? So you have that. And then we're gonna take the um, mixture that you all have and make sure this is on the foil. And again, you can put it on two. Now, one of the reasons we're doing it on foil on a cutting board is because if you have one of these um, to-go containers, the risk of getting a cut slice through here would not be great for you. So we're gonna have you cut it on a cutting board. If you have a regular cookie sheet at home, you can cut it right there in the cookie sheet and not have to transfer, but you still wanna line your cookie sheet so that you don't um, put cut marks into it. All right, so now we're gonna put the filling down. Grab my. So you can sprinkle your filling across the top. We're gonna try and get it as evenly on the bottom as possible so we can spread it out. Okay, so we'll spread it across the top. And this recipe is coming to us from um, Phoebe Radovich, Jesse's mother-in-law. And this is a Lebanese version of baklava. So when I was doing a little bit of research, the typical baklava is of course, we know it has multiple layers, usually can have honey. Um, this one uses sugar. So it's very, it can be a really time consuming process. So this one is actually a, the Lebanese version is actually known as a less sweet version of baklava. So once you get, going back to this, once you get your layer spread out, then we're gonna put the other um, top, oops, we're gonna spread, ah, what you want to try and do is prevent your dough from separating like I did. So line it back up. Again, this is like paper, paper dough. So it's real thin and it will um, shred pretty easy. So line it up as best as you can. And we also learned last week after doing a dry run that it doesn't matter if it's deconstructed or not, it still tastes great. <laughs> So once you get this up on top, then you're going to create some diagonals. So we're going to cut about a two inch diagonal. So we're going to try, if you want to do a half, um, cut through half first, that will give you an idea of where we're going to go next. And then we're going to do it in half again, so that we don't have to get your ruler out. So we'll go half again. I think we did about half. Okay. And then I can do a, an edge. So half again. And once more. All right. So you should have diagonals going one way. And now we need to make a diamond pattern. So we're going to take it and you can rotate it or you can do it on the same um, section. So go half. Okay. And then halves. All right, so we should have our section lined up. And if you have your butter ready to go, we are going to, um, we can actually put this into the pan now. So here's what you wanna do, get your pan as close to that as you can. Uh, so that in case you bump anything, it doesn't go all over your counter. So take your foil, kind of lift it close to the edge, because sometimes what's happened is you've cut through the bottom of that um, foil. So go as gently as you can across. Okay, and then we'll tuck that down. And this is, we're gonna spread your uh, melted butter. So this is when you're gonna need your melted butter. And we're gonna, first of all, if you, if you start with a drizzle, that way you don't 
uh, lift all these layers because we want to keep those layers on top. So get your melted butter. You have a little really cool um, pastry brush so you can drizzle across the top. And we're going to use the whole um, melted butter. So that should be one whole stick that you're using. Okay, so you can drizzle across the top and then eventually it gets to the point where you can actually brush it on. And you'll want to use the whole, um, like I said, the whole stick. And eventually it's going to kind of seep down on the edges, which is good. That will give you that nice, crispy, flaky finished product. You should have your ovens preheated to 350. If you don't, start your oven now so it can heat up. Um, you don't really want to put it into your oven without it being hot enough. So get your oven to 350. Okay. Finish off the butter. Then we're going to bake this. So here's what your recipe talks about in the recipe book that you have. Your recipe book talked about 350 and then lowering it to 300 to cook for that one hour. For the purposes of our class, we're going to keep it at 350 and we're going to bake it for about 40 minutes. So we're going to take this now and we're going to put this into the oven. So it should look pretty much uh, ready to go. We'll put it into the oven. It's at 350 and we're gonna let it sit. So we're gonna time it for 40 minutes, okay? While that's going, we're gonna create our simple syrup. And the reason we're doing that now is because we want it to cool to the thickness of, um, and we want it cold. It's cold syrup going on a hot baklava. So we're gonna make our syrup, which is your half a cup of sugar. So get a small saucepan, half cup sugar, a quarter cup of water. And then with that is two tablespoons of lemon juice. It says LJ, half of my initials. So if anybody can figure out what my middle name is, then ah, half of my middle initials, half of my, half of my initials, three or two thirds of my initials. There we go, not half. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna turn this up now. Here's the trick. Simple syrup is a, usually it's about a 50-50 mix of water and sugar. We wanna get this temperature up quickly. So we wanna do a quick boil. If you do a slow boil, like a slow turnaround boil where you're bringing it up slowly, what happens is that your water is evaporating. And if you evaporate the water, your sugar will seize up and you'll have crystalled sugar in there, a nice, nice crystal in your pan. So we wanna bring this up hot quickly and then we'll cool it down and let it simmer. So let's bring our temp, you could even, you can try you know, high or you can even do like the nine on your stove if you have numbers, okay? So you wanna make sure, yeah. So you should just have the lemon juice and the sugar, which was in a baggie. And you are gonna make, you have water. So get a, a measuring cup for a quarter cup of water, or you can do four tablespoons of water if you don't have a measuring cup. That would be another way of doing um, a quarter cup of water. So right now it's in my pan and we're going to uh, get this up. Remember, we're gonna bring it up to not quite a rolling boil, a rolling boil would be about, if you had a thermometer, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So we don't want it to get a rolling boil. We want a kind of a soft boil. Um, so we're gonna watch for that and it won't take long. Again, we're, we're creating that simple syrup. So it's the sugar will dissolve and you'll get, it will become a clear solution. So that's a good start. Nope, try again. Not Jean. All right. So while this is going, some history about um, phyllo dough is it's the unleavened bread and it's low fat. You know, there's not, it's a low fat bread 
uh, obviously, because, you know, you think about all the thin layers, the typical old fashioned baklava had 40 layers of uh, dough. So it was definitely a time process. This one is much quicker. And like I mentioned before, it is a less sweet um, version of it because it doesn't use honey. Some of them do use honey. Uh, what else do I have on there? So it was um, originated truly back in um, Syria, and it was about third century BCE, so long time ago. And then they actually documented the first one to be the eighth century uh, BC. So it's been around a long time. And phyllo dough stands for leaf in Greek. So it's been around for a long, long time. And it's, of course, every location kind of adapts it to their own area. So it's commonly used in um, different areas. And let's see, what else do I have on there? This simple syrup, if we were to do a thermometer test on it, we'd be getting it to about uh, 215, roughly 200, but th soft thread or thread state is 215 to 234. So we're going just a little bit less than that. How's everybody doing? Got your baklava in the oven and simple syrup cooking. All right. <clears throat> so the other thing too is this has walnuts. Okay, here's a good boil. So you can see how it started to boil. We can get that on video. And now I'm gonna turn it down to my stove. I'm gonna turn it down to about three. The trick is we don't want it to evaporate too much of that water because we want it to still be in a syrupy consistency, but we're gonna get this to go about 10 minutes. So we're gonna simmer it um, for about 10 minutes. So now it's got that, still doing a little bit of the, of the heavier boil over here. It's gonna take a few minutes for my stove top to cool to get to that simmer level. And we can kind of, you can kind of leave this alone. I mean, remember it's, it's not going to um, evaporate as quickly now with the water consistency, just because we turned it way down. And that's what we're looking for is that we're gonna make it a syrupy, so consider like a honey consistency. It will thicken as it goes. So don't be worried that it looks too thin as we get going. So we're gonna time about 10 minutes so it's 520, so about 530, we're gonna see what it looks like. And we'll notice just the consistency will change. So right now it's definitely very much like water and we're gonna hope for a more consistent syrup. All right, so that's gonna cook for a little bit. Let's go over to our shakshuka. Okay, so let's get another saucepan going and we are going to create um, this, and then the, the zata is our last um, cook. Okay, so I will move my board. Yes, for the shakshuka, absolutely. So this one has, um, you should have oil. Let's see, we have SO. So that is shakshuka. I was like, oil, olive oil? No, not quite. Shakshuka oil. Um, you should have an onion. You should have a bell pepper. So a, a, a half, uh, a quarter of an onion. We're going to dice this. Um, bell pepper. You should, the garlic is mixed in. So let's get this little package open. Let's do, let's get this ready. Okay, so here's your garlic. Look at that, it's like a cute little package of garlic here. Now, one of the things about your garlic, you might look at it and say, something's not right about this. Well, it's frozen, Fro it was frozen. So I talked to the chef of Foodland the other night and I asked them, is it okay to freeze garlic? And of course, yes, after I had looked it up and froze it already. <laughs> I asked him just for verification and yes, it can be frozen. So if you buy one of those big bags of garlic, 
you can freeze it and then you don't have to throw it away. Granted, it will be, it will look a little different and it will also be a little bit more mild than it was before. So you should have your bell pepper, garlic, onion, and then you have tomato um, paste. Oh, here we go. Sorry, Jesse, sorry. Tomato paste. So it's in a little container for you. That's your tomato paste. You have chili powder, cumin, paprika, cayenne, sugar, salt. We're gonna put salt and salt and pepper in it. So if you wanna grab your salt and pepper shaker, grab that because you're gonna to add to it. We didn't put salt and pepper in this mix. So this is SS and that will be your shakshaka seasoning. I'm getting to learn all my labels. And this is not for that. So you have, enough, you have two others that are for the, um, the pita bread. And the, this is our uh, Z for Zata seasoning. Okay, so those two are gonna sit on the side for now. And our, our pita we can keep together. So then you also have parsley that will be needed. We'll do a quick check on my syrup. It's looking pretty good. It's not, it, it's thickened. You, you'll see a little bit of thickening. It's not thick, thick, um, but it's definitely gotten a little bit thicker. We're gonna keep that going. And we're gonna start with, uh, we can put our oil into the pan. So we're gonna put the oil in the pan. Traditionally, this was actually a lot of times cooked in a cast iron skillet. So you actually can do a cast iron skillet um, and have the ability to gain some of those great things that come from cast iron. So what you're gonna do is we're gonna dice the bell pepper and we're gonna dice the um, onion. So remember, let's get my oven or my um, stove top going and we're gonna put it into, uh, <clears throat> chop. we're gonna do the onion and the bell pepper. So again, you can do as big or as large of pieces as you'd like. And of course, keep your fingers safe. I always tell people, if you wanna cut it to what you wanna bite into, that's truly what your consistency and sizes. It says chopped, but if you wanna go uh, a small chop, you can do that. Okay, so we're gonna chop up our red onion. I'm not red onion, red pepper. And have that ready. Any long pieces in there, you can have that cut up. All right, so pepper's ready. You have your pan on, your oil is heating up. We're gonna saute that onion first. Okay, so remember dicing the, dicing the onion, you can leave the edge on and then put your, uh, cut, cut with the grain. Remember we've talked about doing that that way each time. So cut with your grain of your onion. And then you can go across and make those cuts. If you have a cleaver, and those are always fun to use, you can chop a little bit faster. Okay, so then you have your onion. And then the last thing we're gonna cut up and, and mince up is our garlic. So you can chop up that. Nice that it's, uh, it's actually a little bit softer when it's been frozen. So a little easier to handle. I got a little bit of onion mixed in there, that's okay. So mince your garlic. And that's pretty much ready to go. So in your skillet, you've got your 
um, oil. We're going to add our onion. So this should be hot. And remember, we can always test our, um, our saute factor if we get some sizzle going. So we've got a good sizzle. We're going to add the onions. Peppers on the side. We're going to add the onion. We're just going to do a light saute. Have your wooden spoon. Okay, you can let that saute uh, a few minutes, three minutes or so, and that'll give it a nice tenderized version of your onions. We've got about, it's like about four minutes left on our syrup. It's looking good. Again, we're looking for that syrup consistency, kind of honey consistency. Again, it will thicken as time goes on and it cools. So we're in good shape. All right. So we've got our onions. We've kind of, we're doing a saute with these. A few minutes and then still got a little bit of, a little more time on the onions. Remember, as you saute them, they're sweetening up a little bit. They are um, softening. So we want to let those go for a few minutes. They may guess yet on my, our uh, trivia yet? Jesse, did anybody guess? Nope. We're, we're, we're kind of like, there's not so many J's out there, but yeah, you're not far off. You also have a can of diced tomatoes for your shakshuka. That was the only thing I did not talk about. So your, your onions are mixing together. So let me tell you historically about this dish. This dish is actually traditionally served, like I mentioned, in a um, cast iron or a tagine um, type of a, a con uh, container, pan. Origin is North Africa. So Tunisia was actually the beginning of where this came from. And it is um, now, of course, we see it, Middle East is really popular. So it has gained ground. And there is, if you search recipes for shakshuka, there's a lot of options for you. Um, and it has the opportunity to be a breakfast, a lunch, or a dinner. So it could really truly be any opportunity for you. It has uh, eggs. So that makes it you know, potentially that egg morning breakfast or anytime else after that. Then we're going to add our ginger. I mean, our, not our ginger, our garlic. Okay. And we're going to let that go until you start to smell your, um, you'll smell the, the garlic. Once you do, that's, that's pretty much good. We don't want your garlic to burn. I bet. So does the lab. So we're going to add our peppers. Good guess, but nope. <laughs> <laughs> We might have, I might have stumped everybody tonight. That's that one trivia thing that we may not get through. I'll tell you at the end. <laughs> oh, that's even a great guess, but no. All right, so you're gonna saute your peppers and I am at less than a minute on my syrup. So we're gonna come back to my syrup and look at that. So we pretty much have, right now it's, it's boiled, um, but it's gotten to the point where it's got a nice consistency so if you take a spoon and you were to let it run off the spoon, it's kind of a honeyer uh, nectar slash honey consistency. And when I talk about nectar, that's like your apricot nectar or your mango nectar, your peach nectar. It's like in between that and honey. So I would say that we are in good shape with consistency. So look for that. If you have it at that consistency and you can even see it's Actually, it's even turned a little bit on the brown side. Um, that's the caramelization going on with that sugar, just a bit. 
So we're gonna turn our burner off. You can let that cool. So keep it off your burner. We'll come back to our shakshuka and our peppers are roast are toasting and getting ready for about five minutes. So I think I'm probably at four minutes to go on that. So another historical um, piece with the uh, shakshuka is again, it was usually in the Middle East. Uh, we do have eggs in there. So now, now is my egg, egg fun. So you should have three eggs. So we're gonna talk about eggs. So eggs, uh, definitely keep them refrigerated. Uh, technically, you should be buying them from stores that have them refrigerated. Um, we just got through Easter, so everybody has maybe has some um, hard-boiled eggs around the house, but definitely um, a great thing to keep in the refrigerator. If you have the opportunity to make hollandaise sauce or Caesar salad or tiramisu, you really should buy or find pasteurized eggs. So. I'll put you all on the hunt for pasteurized eggs. And the first person that finds them in, in the island of Oahu, please let me know, because I keep looking and cannot find them. Uh, Foodland has promised to, bring, promised to bring them in, and I still can't find them there, unless they're going out the door faster than I can get there. So uh, definitely pasteurized eggs. They, they heat them up so that they're safe. You don't have to worry so much about eating them raw or, or lower cooked because of the fact that they are... Um, safer. So food safety and eggs is, is critical. And we really want to get them up to a temperature final uh, of about 160 or hotter. Then if you cook eggs, anything that's cooked in eggs, you could let it sit out for about two hours. And after that point, you, you need to either reheat it back up or you've got to throw it away. So two hours is about your max that you can leave um, egg products out after they've cooked. Now, can we eat raw eggs? Uh, technically, no. So if you put it in your cookie dough, in your other y yummy foods, technically speaking, you should not be eating it raw. But you know, as, as we all grew up, I grew up in the, in the time that we didn't have to, um, we weren't worried about that as much as we are now. So granted, I'm sure there's more cases of food tox and food and tox food in uh, foodborne illnesses than there were when I was younger. So I would say that just be careful. Um, you don't want to eat your whole entire cookie dough mixture raw. Sarah has a guess of Jean. Yay! Good job, Sarah. Yes, it's Jean. So my mom's middle name was also Jean. So she was Beverly Jean and I'm Lara Jean. So nice job. All right. That is still cooking and we are going to eventually get our tomatoes in there. So you can pop open your um, tomatoes. And we're going to do the tomatoes and the tomato paste. And I will show you my syrup one more time because this gets exciting because now it's got that really nice consistency and it will continue to cool and look even more syrupy. All right. So our peppers, our garlic, our onion is in here. And in probably one minute, we're gonna add to it the tomatoes and the spices. So have your little container of SS ready to go and that will go into your um, mixture as well. Okay, so that they've softened up a bit so that you have that nice consistency. Of course, the color of the onions is changing a little bit with the red bell pepper. How's everybody doing on the cooking of the shakshuka with me? So far, so good. Anybody have any questions? Okay. We're ready to put our tomatoes in. And we are ready to put our tomato paste in. So scrape that out with a spoon. <clears throat> the recipe says tomato paste. <laughs> 
compared to why not tomato sauce? So tomato paste from is more concentrated than tomato sauce. Um, so it adds just a little bit more flavor in a less, um, less volume. So yes, that, I knew exactly what you meant. I was thinking, oh, shucks, somebody's gonna ask me about tomato paste and tomato sauce. One being more um, concentrated than the other. So a lot of recipes will have you even make, maybe use both, but the tomato sauce being more um, concentrated. Obviously when you go buy tomato sauce in a container, it usually is sold in a six ounce container or a four ounce container. So very small compared to a large thing of tomato sauce. Um, so smaller smaller container and you don't usually need as much. I mean, it's much more of a flavor pack than tomato sauce. So we'll let this um, sit. We're gonna add, we're gonna get it up to a simmer. We're gonna add your seasoning. Okay, so that has the chili powder, the um, chili powder and cayenne and cumin and paprika all in there, okay? I am going to add the salt. Yeah, good question. That is a good time when you can add it. So it doesn't give us the amount. So here's what I would always tell you. If you start with a pinch, uh, you can keep adding. If you put a tablespoon in, you can't take it away. So start with a pinch. I mean, we've got a, about, I don't know, there's probably two cups of product there. So half a teaspoon max would be really high. So I start with a pinch and then we'll, you can taste it if you wanna uh, pull a little bit out, but I'll do a, a good pinch, pinch and a half. Um, it's fun to watch chefs create recipes or to cook online because they don't measure much of anything. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty interesting to see how they get their flavors combined. And then we're gonna add a little bit of pepper Again, I'll just shake it up across the top. Okay. We're going to bring this up to a simmer. You could actually put, um, it talks about adding sugar. So you could add sugar to this. So some people like their tomato sauces a little bit more sugary or a little sweeter. And the reason is, is those tomatoes are acidic. So it will create that flavor. Um, if you like to add sugar, you can add a little bit to here as well. Um, traditionally, that's why is because they just like it a little bit um, sweeter. So we're going to simmer this about um, five minutes. So we're going to go about to 545. Okay. Let that go. We can get our zata bread started. So we are gonna put, you can get your um, pita bread. And this is from Shaloha Bakery or P, uh, Shaloha Restaurant, I call it that. And it is a, um, over here on Wailai, they have some amazing, Pita bread. So this is fresh um, pita bread, probably the, the freshest you'll ever try. And we're going to put it on in a pan. And do, a, do you want a cookie sheet or? Oh, you could put it. Okay. So just stick it right on the rack. So what we can do is we can actually um, put this right into the oven as it is. You can just put it on your um, layer of tin foil and get it ready. So let me clear some of these things out. So we have, you should find some olive oil. I lost my oil. Where did I put it? Oh. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. So you should have a little container of, um, I can drizzle. Oh, and look at that, I got garlic there. I wanna get that in there. Okay, so your bread. Now, if you wanna use and create just one, one of your pitas, you can. We can definitely do, um, you could use the whole 
bit of oil or you can use part of it. It's up to you. We're just gonna make sure we drizzle it across the top. So that usually that fit just about right. And we're gonna get a um, spoon to be able to smear this across the top. And then you'll have your other uh, pita for another time. Well, we'll still use that for the syrup. Jesse, I'll take that spoon because we'll use that for the syrup. So you can actually, you know, get this across your pita bread. And you, you might ask, well, what side's the right side to put it on? It really depends on the shape, however it's going to hold. I kind of did this one on the shape where it's, it's kind of like a bowl. So pick whatever side looks the best for your um, spreading where it's not gonna run off. All right. Then we have this delicious zata. Now zata is a mix of organic, or usually not organic necessarily, or oregano, thyme, and or margarine. Mar margarine is more of that woodsy floral. And then sumac, which is that tangy, acidic, um, and toasted sesame seeds. So this is the zata. And you feel free to put whatever amount of what you have if you've never tried it, feel free to try it on your finger and see what you like. And then you can add as much as you want to your pita. I believe we sent you home with a teaspoon of it. Again, opportunities to purchase it on Amazon. The, um, the one that is being used tonight is the, Jesse's gonna grab the uh, package so we can actually, I can show you what the package is to look for. So it, from what I understand, this is more of the Lebanese version of Sata. So we'll show you. It is right from Lebanon. So this is the, the type of Sata we've used. So when you talk about a teaspoon, this is a pound of Sata. So it will last you a long time. You can freeze it and keep it for long term. So this is um, a one pound from Amazon. Thanks, Jesse. All right, that's ready to go. We'll get that in a second and come back to your tomato mixture. And we are going to, we're pretty close to our time. We're gonna add our eggs. How many size eggs can we get? That's a trivia question. How many size eggs are there? Chicken eggs. And then you know, how many size eggs can we get? Okay, take your eggs. Um, you don't have to worry about washing these, they're all clean. But what you're gonna do is we're gonna crack them and put them into our mixture. So we're hopefully not gonna break them, but we're gonna, we're, our target is to put them inside here. So we're gonna do one at a time. And while I'm doing this, did anybody come up with how many sized eggs are there? There's more than four. You might actually put, since that one like took off and went right in the center, you might create a little um, pocket for it. And I can turn my feet down just a little bit. So take another guess at how many sized eggs we actually have out there. I mean, what's available to us most of the time is probably those four but they actually have more than that. We start as small as Pee Wee and go all the way up. What's that? Oh, that's even a good guess, a little high. Okay, so you've got your eggs in there. A little too high. So it starts with Pee Wee's and goes all the way up to extra large or jumbo. One too many, good guess. One too many. Now, what you're gonna do, we cracked all those eggs um, and we will put it depending on how you lay it out. Um, you know, you're, it's somewhat random in there. And then we're gonna put our lid on it. So we're gonna cover this and we're gonna let this simmer about 10 minutes and then we'll check our time. Our baklava has seven minutes. So we have um, that. And I can look at our beautiful syrup here. 
How's that for honey consistency? So that's what you're shooting to get at the end. It didn't get so thick that we can't use it and spread it. If you ended up with a really thick syrup, last week we did it and it was thick. So what we did was we added about a teaspoon of water, um, one teaspoon at a time and one teaspoon kind of pulled it out of that thickness. So if yours looks too thick, it probably got a little bit dehydrated and we need to just add a little bit of water back into it. So we can do that. Okay, so six eggs was our answer. <clears throat> the world's largest egg was from an extinct Madagascan elephant bird. Think about elephant bird. This is a big egg. So it was equivalent to about 8.5 liters of egg, which was equivalent to about seven of what's the largest bird? What's the largest living bird that creates an egg that we know of? Does anybody know that answer? And those are usually about three pounds, to be honest. So what's our rough estimate of what's the largest bird? Close. Well, I, I think they're, yeah, the same family, ostrich, um, ostrich eggs. So those are about um, three pounds. So that was equivalent, this, this ancient one. The biggest was uh, seven ostrich eggs altogether. So again, we have all kinds of ways to do that. And when we talk about eggs, um, again, we talked about the peewees and they go all the way up to jumbo. So my question for you, some, a little bit of trivia here. I always ask students trivia. So this one's a good one. How do we get peewee eggs all the way up to jumbo eggs? How do, why is there a difference and how do we get to those sizes? How do you, different chickens? You know, um, bigger chickens, smaller chickens. How do we get peewee eggs versus jumbo eggs? Does anybody know that answer? And then my second question, I actually got to give you three. What's, how do we change the shell? How, how are the shell colors? How do they come out different? How come we have brown eggs? We have white eggs? We have blue eggs? How, how all from chickens? How do we get those differences? For the size or for the shell? So I, I, sorry, I'm running off with like two questions. I got one more question for you. I'll wait, <laughs> size. So good guess, but no. Uh, let's see. The last one, my last question, and we'll try and hit all these in order, is what changes the yolk color? You noticed our yolks are pretty much standard yellow color. What changes the yolk color of an egg? So three questions. We'll see what you come up with. In the meantime, what's our time on our baklava? It's about four minutes. Okay. So we can kind of get a peak view of what our baklava should look like. So if you're looking at it, you're looking for a nice brown um, on the edges. And we're still trying to get that nice toasty brown on the center. So we're going to definitely let it go for that four more minutes. But it's looking absolutely perfect. And again, this was a faster cook time. So your recipe talks about cooking it at 300 degrees for an hour. We did it at 350 for 40 minutes. So it's a little bit faster. So. Has anybody figured out how do we get different sized eggs? Uh, how about the amount of wet That's a great guess, but no. <laughs> Good try. Anybody else? How do we get different sizes? Because we can get peewees. You don't see them too often in the stores. We see, there's one, I, I have a fourth question. There's all kinds of eggs that we see, but the typical egg that we use is also one size. Most recipes are geared towards this one size. So that's my last question. So, size, what do we have? Uh, so, size for the type of egg and different breeds or different sizes. Age or type? Oh, somebody got the target. Somebody got the gold star. Age. The younger the chicken, the smaller they are. So, that's how you get peewees. Younger chickens, younger, smaller eggs. Older chickens, older hens, um, larger eggs. So, what we usually see in the stores is the traditional medium uh, large, who well, that's the extra large. So my second question was, how do we change the color? Somebody has some ideas in that, but they were guessing on the wrong question. So, yeah, so, so uh, Jody, all the way from Las Vegas, yeah. has, has said uh, uh, different breeds like different colors. Thumbs up. Good job, Jody. Go, go bet tonight because you're lucky. <laughs> you got a lucky bet. <laughs>
Yes, the different breeds create the different colors. So the organic eggs that you might see in the store, the brown, the white, they're all the same nutritional value. They don't change. It's just the type of chicken. So the, I don't know all the different chicken types, um, names, but yes, that's the difference. How about the color of the yolk? How can I affect the color of the yolk? What can that, how can we change that? That's, that's another tricky one. So that's the last question. And then the last, the, no, the third question was how do we change the yolks? The last question was what size does your typical recipe call for? So question number three, still un hanging out there and question number four. So let's see what we got. Jesse's gonna give me the heads up. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> I like that. I think I need to go out and get a bunch because I'm a chocolate fan. <laughs> That's like brown cows make chocolate milk, right? We all know that. So um, the, the yolks can change by diet. You can actually, in, in Japan, they feed them, there's, com there's um, farms that feed them chili powder and um, chili powder and I think that was the big thing that changed and paprika you can make a beautiful colored egg yolk by that so the diet and they don't the chickens don't taste the spiciness they don't know that it's hot um, but the cayenne pepper and the paprika make that color change my last question being what size do we use typically large yes large eggs so if you see a recipe that says eggs you go for the large Typically, you'll see, I think even at Costco, Sam's Club, they used to sell only extra large. Now they've gone back and they've sold just large, which is really good. So that'll give us about a two ounce per egg. And that's what we're shooting um, to, to do in a recipe. Okay. Our baklava is ready to go. So we're going to pull that out and turn off my oven. And this is what you're looking for. So beautiful brown, um, toasty, okay? Does anybody know what that reaction is on the top? Ooh, there's another question for you. What's the reaction? What did we create? It starts with M. Okay. So hot baklava, cool sauce. We're gonna put it across the top. And just like I did with the butter, we're gonna drizzle it first because otherwise you'll lift all those papers off. So we're gonna drizzle first. And it's, wow, look at that syrup. Jesse, we did it this week. Last week we were struggling with our thick. We got, you actually, to, to tell you the truth, you actually have a full recipe of the sauce or of the syrup. The half recipe, when we did it, it's because your water content is so low that your risk of getting it um, to seize up and crystallize was way too risky. So we just decided we'll give you the whole recipe. And that's why it, it's actually a little bit more than what you would typically put on a half recipe. But it made it so that it was almost a fail-proof way of creating this top. My hard reaction. There you go, Sarah. Great job. Yes. <clears throat> my hard reaction. So there's the my hard reaction caramelization going on. So basically you have um, a protein and a sugar and that's what creates the my hard reaction. So it turns our baked goods brown. And we need to check our shakshuka. And oops, I need to turn up my Turn up my oven to 400. I'm gonna blast it a little bit hotter to get this thing going faster. So you wanna turn up your oven. We have six minutes left, so we're close. Okay, so there is your finished baklava. Beautiful, perfect. Now, woo, I think we simmered a little bit too long, but we are looking at shakshuka. So your eggs, here's the thing with eggs. Make sure your whites are cooked. Now, obviously my whites and my yolks are cooked. So you're going to get, um, you're going to have that, um, nice egg consistency. And if you let them go a little bit less, less time, then you're going to have that nice, uh, we kind of forgot and those got a little bit firmer, but you'll have that nice egg top. Um, and we'll show you the final as we put it across. 
here is your parsley. So you can chop up your parsley and we will put it over the top of the um, dish once we get this off the heat. And so you can chop up your parsley nicely and then just put it across the top. And of course you can do this if you have a, if you're using a cast iron skillet, you can um, serve it right in the cast iron skillet or you can take it out of the pan. So either way, you can create um, your shakshuka, okay? Do I have any questions standing out there? I think I got them all, but let's show you the final product of all of this. We're gonna put our uh, zaza bread in there. I think our temperature is hot enough, so five minutes, okay? And for some reason it didn't kick in. Now I have it. So if you need to wait a few minutes to get your temperature in your oven up to 400, wait, don't worry about it. You can create this and get it cooked. Um, but you're basically gonna do it right at about five minutes once that oven temperature gets up to about 400. And you should come out with a pretty much, um, it'll toast a little bit. You want it to be, Still, it's gonna be a little bit soft. You don't want it to, to crack. Um, it's not a hard bread. So you definitely wanna have that as your softness. Then I will show you the finished shakshuka in a bowl. So you can use your other pita for um, dipping or eating with that. Oh, so here is a Remember, this is pita bread. So there is a pocket, if I can find it. Maybe not. It, it, got, all soft. it got a little bit soft. So if you do have a nice pocket still, like if yours stayed um, without getting too soft, you could fill it inside the pocket. We have a, I think it got a little bit too soft. Here we go. So then you can put it inside. Yeah. All right, let's do one thing at a time. Let's take the tomatoes and then let's take our egg. And there you go. There is your shock sugar. Okay, so we've got that as a final. And then we also can show you baklava as a final. So again, Little different than your traditional multi-layered um, walnuts, layered phyllo dough, layered honey. So it's a little less sweet. This is kind of remember I mentioned it's the the known as the less sweet, the Lebanese version, and this is actually truly a Lebanese version. Our wonderful um, Jesse's wonderful mother-in-law provided our recipe, so it is proven as a Lebanese. She's Lebanese heritage, and that is her recipe. So we in, impart that on you, and you can make it as many times as you'd like. You can find phyllo dough. It's found in the freezer section of most grocery stores. So look for it in the freezer section, kind of by the pie crusts that you can buy pre-made. So with that, this is April. We have one more to go in May before we finish the series. And then we'll start back up in September of next um, in the fall. So we hope that you'll continue to join us. We'll see you in May. We're going to do a Cinco de Mayo theme because we are doing it on May the 7th. We're setting a date, <laughs> doing a Cinco de Mayo kind of a theme, so um, Mexican cooking. So look for that to come up, and then we will we'll stop at that point for the and break for the summer, and we will be back in September. And hopefully, you can join us again. So look for the emails. Yes, we will post this video to the YouTube channel for the CTAR um, group, and you will be more than welcome to come back anytime, share it with anybody else. This is how we get our name out there. So we have really enjoyed sharing this with you. We're going to expand our numbers again. And so hopefully we'll see more of you on board next month and have a great evening. Have a happy weekend. It's Friday. So it's uh, pow after Pauhana. So we're ready to roll. Have a great one. Bye.